morning, Ms. Bless. Thank you, witness. Thanks, my Lord. Ms. Bless, before you're seated, would you, would you uh, get your sworn in? Would you raise your right hand, state your name? Christine Bless. Would you spell your last name? B L E S S. Hutchinson, when you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, by whom are you currently employed? By the New Jersey State Police Office of Forensic Sciences DNA Laboratory. And what is your current job or title? I'm a forensic scientist one. Um, and what does that mean? What does forensic scientist one mean? Uh, forensic scientist one is a position that we also work on casework. Um, so whatever evidence is submitted to the laboratory, we will process that and then um, write our reports in. Now, how long have you been employed by the New Jersey State Police Lab? I've been with the State Police for 14 years. Um, and what unit are you currently assigned to? The DNA Laboratory Caseworking Unit. And how long have you been with the DNA Caseworking Unit? About six years. <clears throat> Could you explain to the jury some of uh, your duties or responsibilities within your job itself? Sure. Um, our primary duty, my primary duty, is to analyze evidence for crime scenes, write reports, I report out my interpretations and conclusions. Um, and then I also have duties with regard to case submissions, approving evidence to come into the laboratory, making sure that we have the information that we need um, to be able to uh, process the evidence. Um, and those between the submissions and, and case management duties and case working, writing up cases, those are my primary duties. Now, prior to being assigned to the DNA section of the lab, did you have any other experience in any other fields of forensic science? Uh, originally, I was with our equine testing unit. We did um, toxicology analysis for uh, the horse racing uh, tracks in New Jersey. And then I spent under a year with our um, databasing laboratory working on um, samples from known individuals. Um, now, can you describe your educational background? I have a bachelor's of science in biological sciences from Cook College. <coughs> of Rutgers University, and a Master's of Science in Forensic Science from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Thank you. Um, now, after completing your formal education, did you obtain any additional training in the areas of DNA um, or DNA analysis? Uh, the DNA Laboratory has a training program for caseworking analysts that lasts approximately one year. Um, in, as part of that training, we do uh, different readings, so textbooks, journal articles. We um, do laboratory training, so we observe and then perform each of the procedures in the laboratory, and then we write up cases, um, interpret data, do statistical analysis, uh, and once you complete all of that, then I did a written exam, uh, an oral board, nope, written exam, laboratory practical, and a moot court. Thank you. Um, now, do you presently hold any professional certifications in the area of DNA and DNA analysis? Um, well, I'm, I'm certified with the DNA laboratory um, to perform analysis. Now, as part of the certification process, were you trained in the application of statistics and the results of DNA analysis? Yes, we have training with regard to statistics as part of our um, training every year, and then I also have training from my time at Rutgers. Um, I took a statistics course there. A successful completion of that training um, within the lab required for your current position? Yes, it is. Um, now, looking to the New Jersey State Lab itself, is it accredited? The laboratory is accredited, yes. And by whom? Uh, by the American National Standards Institute, their uh, national accreditation board. Um, now, are you familiar with the proficiency testing? Yes, proficiency testing is a program that tests the quality of an analyst's work. So what happens is we get a mock case into the laboratory. Every analyst is proficiency tested. You get a mock case, you run your samples through the laboratory, you develop the DNA profiles, and then you report out those profiles to an outside agency, and then those profiles get checked to confirm that you have obtained the correct profile. And have you yourself passed the proficiency training or testing? Yes. Um, now you've been assigned to use the DNA portion of the lab for six years now, is that right? Yes. Can you estimate approximately the number of times that you've been called to conduct DNA analysis? Um, I've worked on approximately 2,000 cases, um, which is about 5,000 samples that analyzed. 
And now during the during the tenure, have you been thought of as an ex expert witness previously? I have. Approximately how many times? <coughs> Fifteen. And do you recall what courts? Uh, various superior courts throughout New Jersey, Hudson, uh, Burlington, Mercer, um, a few other counties, and then also in federal court. And in what fields have you actually been qualified as an expert witness? Usually it's uh, forensic DNA analysis. Your Honor, at this time, the state would offer uh, Ms. Lutz as an expert in their forensic DNA analysis. Any one here? No, Your Honor, no objection. Court accepts uh, Ms. Bless as an expert in the field of DNA analysis based on her knowledge, skill, experience, training, and education that she could render her opinion. Thank you. Now, Ms. Bless, can you explain to the jury what DNA is briefly? Uh, DNA is a molecule found in the body that basically is the code for everything that your body is, everything that it does. So, two arms, two legs, all the enzymes that break down food in your stomach, basically everything that you are is coded in your DNA. It's found in the various cells throughout your body. It's found in blood cells, skin cells, uh, sperm cells. And basically, it's unique to an individual with the ex exception of identical twins. And your DNA profile will stay the same throughout your lifetime. Um, now, why is DNA so important in the field of forensic science itself? Uh, it allows us to compare evidence left at crime scenes to um, DNA profiles from known individuals in order to determine if um, someone could be the person that left behind the DNA at the crime scene. So it allows us to link um, people to um, evidence left behind at scenes. And you said, aside with the, I guess, with the exception of identical twins, uh, DNA is unique to refer to an individual person? Yes. Um, what type of DNA technology is used at the lab? Uh, we use a technology called PCR-STR analysis, and basically we use this in order to develop the DNA profiles. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and that is a series of steps that the DNA undergoes to make copies of the areas that we're interested in. So we're not looking at all of your DNA, we're looking at portions of your DNA, um, and we're making copies of those portions uh, to try and give us enough from small amounts of DNA give us enough to uh, visualize the result. So we use the PCR process to make these copies, and the areas that we're making copies of are called uh, short tandem repeats. That's the STRs, and basically those are short segments of DNA that are repeated kind of one after another, and we basically count up the number of repeats that a person has at a particular location. So say you get eight repeats on the DNA from your mother, nine repeats on the DNA from your father at a particular location, then your DNA profile at that location would be eight, nine. And we do this for 23 different locations throughout the DNA, as well as three locations that are specific to males on the Y chromosome. And we look at uh, a sex determining location, and basically we end up with a string of numbers that makes up a DNA profile. Um, now can you explain what a DNA, what a sample or um, a reference, a known sample or a reference sample is? Uh, a known sample or a reference sample is a sample taken from uh, a person, we know the source of it basically. So if you took a cheek swab from me right now, that would be a DNA reference or a known sample from me. So we know whose DNA is on the item. Now turning to the case itself, during the course of your employment with the lab, were you assigned to work specifically in the case of State versus Christopher Teeter? I was, yes. And uh, what was your assignment specifically in regard to this case? Um, I analyzed the unknown evidence that was submitted from our serology unit, as well as the reference or known samples that came in. Um, and then I put them through the laboratory and then I made comparisons. Um, after interpreting the profiles, I made comparisons and then reported out my conclusions. Okay, so you said it was, it was submitted to you or you received it after serology, is that right? The unknown. The unknown items or the items from the crime scene came from serology, yes. Um, and the reference samples that you spoke of in this case, did you receive one from Paul Stevens, which was the victim in this matter? Yes, I believe it was Paul Stevens Jr. Yes, what I had. Okay. Yes. And how about the suspect, Christopher Teeter? Yes, I received a reference from him as well. Now, are there any steps taken in the lab to ensure that your results um, are reliable and accurate? Oh, we have a number of steps that we um, follow uh, that we're required to follow. Um, the first one is uh, personal protective equipment. So if anyone is handling evidence, 
they're wearing a lab coat, gloves, face mask, hair net, basically to keep our DNA off of any samples. Uh, equipment, bench tops, instrumentation is sterilized either with bleach, ultraviolet light, or some other chemical that will break down DNA between uses. And then we have, you know, if you put a sample set up for processing, someone witnesses that step to make sure you're putting the correct sample in the correct place. We have controls that run through the laboratory with the samples. Negative controls should go through the process and have no DNA at the end. Positive controls um, will go through and you have a known profile in those positive controls and you should get that profile at the end um, that shows that things are working as they, they should. And then our reports go through a two-step review process. The first step is um, called a peer review or a technical review. And that's basically another certified analyst that has the same training I do. They go through the report and they look at what you did. They look at your interpretations, your conclusions, your statistics, make sure that they agree with um, everything that was done and that it was done, they check that it was done correctly. Uh, and then after they do their review, there's a second review called an administrative review that checks for technical correctness. I'm sorry, they check for um, that the conclusions are supported by the data, any typographical errors, that conclusions are in line with laboratory policy. Thank you. Now, is it possible to take DNA from a biological stain like found at a crime scene or on an item and compare it to the DNA found from a known reference sample, meaning the victim or the suspect in this case? If the profile obtained from the crime scene item is suitable for comparison, then yes. Okay. And um, what can this comparison, type of comparison, tell you? Uh, it basically tells us whether the person can be excluded as the person that left behind the DNA, like they couldn't possibly be the person that left the DNA behind that we have on the evidence, or whether they're included and they could possibly be the person that left behind that, uh, the DNA of the crime scene. Now, as the analyst on this case, uh, did you, in fact, conduct testing on pieces of evidence that you had received? Yes. Um, now, before I get into the specific pieces of evidence themselves, can you just explain the the four-part test or the type of testing that you do? Yes. In order to develop profiles from either unknown samples from a crime scene or known reference samples, the items go through a four-step process in the laboratory. The first step is an extraction step where we're using heat and chemicals to break open the DNA. Uh, the DNA is found in cells, so we're trying to break open the cells and release the DNA. We're extracting it out of the cell um, and into a solution. The second step is a quantitation step where we get a rough idea of how much DNA is present in the sample. The third step is an amplification step or, and the amplification step is that PCR process that I described earlier where we're making lots of copies of the areas that we're interested in. And then after that, we, the fourth step is a detection step where we run the sample through an instrument and at the end of that we get a chart that basically gives us a visual representation of any DNA present in that sample. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to speak to the specific laboratory items in this case. Um, I want to draw your attention to items 3-1-1-1, 3-3, and item 4. Do you recall, just of your own volition, what those items are? Or would um, it be helpful to look at your report in this case? I could probably be more accurate if I had the report. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as S35.
looking into for further analysis for DNA. So they cut a portion of that. Um, of if they had a stain, they sent a portion of that uh, to DNA for further testing. Okay, now item 3 3. Uh, can you say what you're about it? 3 uh, 3 is uh, shoelace. Okay. And I don't use this. I'm sorry. I think there were two. Shoelace is two, right? Yeah. Okay. And then item 4. Item 4 is a knife. Okay. Now, did you run each of those pieces of evidence through the four-part testing process that you just explained to us? Yes, I did. And um, did you follow the quality control steps that you also explained with regard to um, keeping everything thorough and basically having everything double-checked in this case? Yes, I did. And when you ran those four pieces of evidence through the four-part testing procedure, did you obtain any genetic profile from any of those items? Uh, yes, we had results from uh, the sample from the right shoe, um, both shoelaces gave results, as well as the swabbing from the blade of the knife and the swabbing from the handle of the knife gave results as well. Okay. And um, did you record your conclusions in, the, in your report? I did, yes. Now, in addition to the pieces of evidence that you tested that you just spoke about, you said you also, um, did you also run the known reference samples, meaning that of Paul Stevens Jr. as well as the suspect Christopher, uh, Christopher Teeter? Yes, I did. And did you obtain genetic profiles for each of the reference and control specimens? Yes. And did you record those profiles in your report? Uh, the profiles themselves are in the case file. The report just references the results of the comparisons. Now, as part of your examination of the case, you indicated that you ran the, the pieces uh, through the four-part testing. Was uh, The one item that we spoke about first was the right shoe. Um, now, can you explain your examination uh, as to that specific item? Um, the uh, sample that was sent from serology went through the four-step process in the laboratory. Uh, the results were obtained and then uh, compared to the DNA reference sample samples that we had uh, for the for uh, Mr. Teeter and Mr. Stevens. Um, and what was the result with regard to that swabbing from the right shoe? Um, I'll read it and then I'll go through it if that's okay. Sure. Um, so a mixed STR DNA profile consistent with at least two contributors was identified from item number 3-1-1. Assuming two contributors, the STR DNA profile of Paul Stevens Jr. matches the interpreted major STR DNA profile. The calculated frequency of the major uh, STR DNA profile is one in at least 2.62 trillion for randomly selected unrelated individuals. Uh, Christopher Teeter is excluded as a possible contributor to the interpreted major STR DNA profile. And finally, the minor STR DNA profile is not of sufficient quantity and or quality for comparison purposes. So start off, item 3-1-1 for the DNA laboratory is a sample from the right shoe. Um, what we got is a mixture, so samples that contain DNA from more than one person is a mixture, which is what we have here. It's consistent with at least two contributors. Um, so assuming two contributors, the profile of Paul Stevens matches the interpreted major profile. So a major profile, when you have a mixture, you can have the type of mixture where there's a lot more DNA from one person than the other person. And that, in that case, we're able to separate the person with more DNA we basically get stronger signals for those. And you're able to, to take uh, the DNA from that person or that contributor, and we call that the major portion. There's a lot of DNA from that person, so they're the major contributor. And then the DNA from the, that's left is the minor portion. So in this sample, there was more DNA present on the sample uh, for the major portion, and that was what matched uh, Paul Stevens Jr. And then, because he couldn't be excluded from that sample, he matched that sample, I did the statistical analysis for that. And the um, statistic came out to the frequency of one in at least 2.62 trillion for randomly selected unrelated individuals. So what that means is you would need a randomly selected group of people, over two trillion people, to expect to see um, one person match that profile. You need a group of people that large um, to expect one person to randomly match that profile. Um, 
And then um, finally, for, with regard to the major portion, Christopher Teeter is excluded from the major portion. Um, so it doesn't match him. He couldn't have left that part of the profile. And then with regard to the minor contributor or the low level portion of the DNA, um, there was not sufficient quantity or quality to make any comparisons to that um, other part of the DNA sample. So for that one, um, no comparisons. Looking 